Hello and welcome to the Indie Alternative Podcast. It's me, Chris. Uh, on this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Laird. How are you, Paul? I am very well, Chris, and thank you so much for having me on the Indie Alternative Podcast. <laughs> I, I don't know how indie or alternative I actually am. <laughs> you're the you're the you're the original Indie Alternative one, surely. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly the original something, that's for sure. <laughs> um, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for coming on. And then we've got uh, some, a fascinating conversation to have about your, your new book. Uh, you've been busy writing. Yeah, so I've written this book called The Birth and Impact of Britpop, Misshapes, Scenesters and Insatiable Ones. And it's been picked up by a publisher called Pen and Sword. And it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be released on June the 30th. Uh, available at all good bookshops from then, yeah. Uh, has this been like a, a, a very cathartic process for you? Well, it's interesting, Chris. Um, you know, you, you and I have been in contact at various points um, through, you know, Twitter and kind of pinging messages backwards and forwards for a, a fair old while. And I was writing about Britpop, oh gosh, probably from about... 2017, 2018, I had a, a, a blog, which I rather grandiosely called a website. Um, <laughs> and it was called the Mild Mannered Army, uh, which was actually a nod to another indie band. It was a, a nod to a Canadian band called the Hidden Cameras. And um, the, the initial in, intention there was, a, a bit like the Indie Alternative podcast, was to speak to people or to write about, in my case, all sorts of things, people from all sorts of corners of the indie universe, including film and literature. But slowly but surely, I began to write more and more about Britpop. And, you know, there was a couple of reasons for that. One was that was my era, man. And <laughs> the other was people were reading it and were liking it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'd written hundreds of thousands of words without exaggeration hundreds of articles about all sorts of things and so when I had the idea to, to start pitching the idea of a book to publishers I thought you know maybe I could take some of those throwaway pieces and use them as kind of the skeleton for the book and then the book became part memoir part social history but but entirely about trying to do something that none of the other books on Britpop had done, which was to shine a light on the sorts of bands that I think you and I probably both share a love for, you know, the, mm. the bands at the corners of the room, the bands on the fringes, and to talk about how those bands impacted on kids like me during the 90s. You approach this from a very different perspective, which is quite refreshing to read, because I'm 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 guessing, like you, you've read an awful lot of literature that other people have written, and obviously from from major releases to, like you say, blogs and fanzines and things. But I think what's refreshing is it that the, the personal approach that you you follow because it's it's personal, but it's also very introspective. And and I think reading it, you find so much of your own experiences sort of dovetailing into it. If that makes sense. Well, you, you've read probably all of the same things that I've read, Chris, right? Like yeah. John Harrison's The Last Party. Yes. Daniel Rachel's Don't Look Back in Anger. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was Britpop. That um, one I that one I've only skimmed, but yeah, I I I know of it. Yeah, there there is about four or five, isn't there? There are the main yeah. the big hitters. And then you've got all the biographies as well, yeah, right? yeah. autobiographies. And one of the things that I did right at the very beginning was I went back to John Harris's The Last Party and I went to the index. And I looked for all the bands that I had been obsessed with. Yeah. And very few of them feature in the last party. And, and that came as quite a shock to me because it's billed as the definitive Britpop book, The Last Party. And it's a great book and it's incredibly well written. John Harris is a phenomenal writer and, you know, journalistic writer as well. Yeah. But it isn't really about the bands or the music. And so I took all the bands that weren't featured in that and decided that they would form the heart of my book. And then you're absolutely right. What I wanted to do was talk about what it was like to be young, what it was like to be at the centre of something as big as Britpop became, but also to talk about how music impacted on me, because I don't think any of my personal experiences in the book are unique to me. 
Mm. I think lots of other people have fallen in love and fallen out of love. I think lots of other people struggle with their mental health. I think lots of people struggle with trying to find out who they are and find their place in the world. And so these are personal, introspective stories, but they are universal themes. And so I, I wanted those two things to kind of coalesce. So yes, you get the dates and the events, but more than that, you get a story, you get a, a feel for what it was like to be at the last party. And so those experiences that you add uh, and you sort of flesh out in the book, were there many that you had to kind of, was there a greatest hits, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, of, of ex- personal experience that you knew that you had to include? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult now because I, I, I've not read the book in its entirety for a little while now, you know, once the editing process was was finished, I kind of have left it alone. But so I can't even remember, you know, which anecdotes are in it. And I don't want to spoil things for people. But w- one of the ones that I knew had to go in uh, involves going to see Blur on the Park Life tour. And my friend, my best friend uh, at that time, a guy called Chris Whitehill, um, we went to see Blur on the Park Life tour and managed to blag our way on the guest list. Um, through a chance encounter with Paul Tunkin, who was the lead singer in the Weekenders, but was also the man behind Blow Up. And we were backstage at the gig in Edinburgh, Sleeper were the support band, and I was sitting at a table with Damon Albarn, my girlfriend, and Chris, and a gaggle of other people, desperate to be around the most famous man in the country. Hmm. And Damon regaled us all with an incredibly boring analysis of how To The End was going to be a number one single because Radio 2 would playlist it and Housewives would love it. And I vividly remember sitting backstage and just glancing to the back of the backstage area and there was Louise Wenner surrounded by this gaggle of incredibly beautiful young girls, you know, all laughing and joking and giggling. And (laughs) I remember thinking at that moment, oh god I've made a really terrible terrible decision (laughs) I'm in the wrong part of the room so you know the 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 book is filled with those little kind of sort of anecdotes but in terms of big experiences there's a lot of coverage I guess of you know mental health and also a lot of stuff about my slightly peculiar and slightly wonky religious upbringing how did that kind of um shape you then that that the sort of religious side of things did it kind of spur you to do something slightly different and and, or look for for other ways to kind of rebel in a way well yeah if if only chris if only (laughs) i I just i just don't have a rebellious streak really it's it's funny so for people who follow me on twitter will will kind of know a little bit of this already but for people who maybe don't and are only picking this up because of the book i was brought up as a mormon and people will think of brandon flowers and the killers or low or the Osmonds, more likely, or maybe the musical, The Book of Mormon. And Mormonism is a slightly peculiar religious belief system. A lot of people think maybe they practice polygamy and things, and they they actually don't. But some of the rumours are definitely true. So I was brought up to believe that smoking, drinking, tea, coffee, sex outside of marriage, any other form of sexual behaviour, dating before the age of 16, Uh, that these things were verboten and that God himself had decreed that I should not do them and that there was a grave punishment lying in wait for people who did do those things. Now, that then makes your presence at the heart of a rock and roll revolution (laughs) quite quite tricky, right? So I'm I'm there, you know, I'm, I'm backstage at, I don't know, maybe, I remember going to see Gene backstage at the Forum, I think it was, in London at some point. And I knew Martin a little bit. And so I was backstage at this Jean gig and there's people from Oasis and there's people from this band and that band and people are imbibing and ingesting all sorts of stuff and everybody's having a gay old time of it. And there I was, this slightly kind of monastic figure just kind of dancing around the fringes. I I felt a little bit during the 90s, I felt a little bit like Kenneth Williams. You know, he tells this great (laughs) story about being on the back of Sheila Hancock's scooter and riding around the statue of Eros in London, and he's waving his umbrella and shouting, where's the OJ? Where's the OJ? <laughs> and, and actually, if you'd taken Kenneth to an OJ, he would have run a mile. And I, I feel like I was kind of the Kenneth Williams of Britpop. People often talk nowadays about um, imposter syndrome, and uh, you know the fact that you've got connections, and, and uh, you were there at a lot of these sort of early stages of the Britpop and the scene. Do you, do you feel that actually, you know, you were part of it, but do you feel slightly 
like the same thing on the outside of it? Gosh, that's a great question, Chris. Um, I mean, I spend most of my waking life feeling like an imposter in one way or another. Yeah. Um, and yes, I, I, I think I probably do feel conflicted. On the one hand, I was there. You know, I really did go to all these things and I did meet all of these people and I did have these experiences. And of course, you know, a lot of these things have been glossed over by the passing of time, you know, and they've been elevated to maybe be slightly bigger and grander than they actually were at the time. But they, they did happen. There is a kernel of truth in all of them. But at the same time, yeah, you're right. You know, uh, I wasn't, you know, um, drinking Johnny Dean under the table at the Good Mixer, right, because I wasn't drinking. Um, so I was only ever there kind of on the fringes, this, well, maybe on the fringes of the centre. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so when you look back at it, you know, in terms of um, living, in, well, let me phrase this slightly differently now, because you're you're kind of living in, you've lived and breathed it for so long and you've written about it for so long. What's the overriding kind of emotion that you feel about the era? And um, just before you answer the question, because, you know, in the book, you touch on a lot of things that I I often think about and have tried to sort of bring up in the conversations I've had with guests is the, is the, um, the tox, the toxicness of it all. Uh, and, and how maybe at the time it was all fantastic, but looking back now, it's, it's tinged with some, some embarrassment, I think, from my point of view, what's your overriding emotion about it? Well, look, it was, it was a, a, a wonderful time to be young, right? There's no doubt about that. All, all of those myths and legends about Britpop, about, you know, the positivity in the country, the mood for change, uh, the hope that we all felt, you know, as that particular Conservative government collapsed and the, 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 the promise of what New Labour seemed to be offering, that's all true. And, you know, the sun really did shine for quite a long time during that period. But you're absolutely right, Chris, there is a toxicity that lies at the heart of the story. And that is revealed in very small but significant ways, right? So Noel Gallagher making that comment about, you know, the guys from Blur dying of AIDS. Yeah. That, that's awful. You know, that's a really unpleasant thing to say. And listen, I'm a big free speech guy in very many ways, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, that that wasn't said in a stand-up set and there wasn't a punchline at the end of it, right? It was just a really nasty, unpleasant thing to say. And I think it revealed something about, you know, Noel at that point. Now, people change and move on. I don't think Noel would make that comment now, right? Mm -hmm. So fine. I think if you look at some of those interviews with Louise Wenner at the time, there's, there's a classic example when she appears on TFI Friday and Chris Evans basically spends 10 minutes hitting on her and making all sorts of lewd comments. It's awful. It's really mm. nasty and kind of vulgar um, and boorish. So that kind of lad culture element, that loaded culture element of it, did happen. It was there. I tend to split Britpop off into two different things, right? And I know a lot of people don't agree with this, and they do, a lot of people actually don't like it, and, and they get quite cross with me for this. I think you go from sort of 91, 92, 93 with Denham, St. Etienne, the Auteurs, Suede, uh, Blur, guess Elastica. Me. Elastica. Elastica at that early stages, early stages, you know, Echo Belly are floating around, Shagging in the Streets, Return to Splendor EP, you know, th there is a real kind of indie aesthetic and a mod aesthetic floating around, you know, those classic images of blur, you know, kind of skinheads, mop tops, British image number one, you know, and it's yeah. all very arch, it's all very knowing, it's all very kind of, I mean, it's borderline kind of postmodernist. And then in 94, Oasis arrive, and through no fault of their own, well, maybe, through no fault of their own, <laughs> things shift slightly and things go off in a different direction. So you have Oasis arrive and Loaded Magazine arrives. And at that point, I think Britpop carries on, but it's not, you know, Paul Weller's Heavy Soul. It's not Ocean Colour Scene. It's not Cast. It's not all sorts of other things. It's something very different. And that, that is beautifully encapsulated by going to see the Manic Street Preachers in, say, 95, 96. And the audience is no longer, you know, kind of leopard print, mascara, 
and situation a slogan scrawled on t-shirts but but is instead people hurling pint point a pint pot sorry chris when people when the manics are singing we only want to get drunk yeah and, yeah. and, and missing the idea of libraries give us power right so you have a kind of lad culture stone island bucket hats all that kind of stuff and then you have a kind of indie version of Britpop, which continues to rumble along, Manta Ray, Flamingos, Elastica, Echo Belly, um, Strange Love, Marion, Long Pigs, right? I mean, the list is endless. And, and sometimes those two things cross over, and sometimes those things that I don't like do things that I do like, right? Like there are lots of Oasis records that I love, like I really love them. There are moments in the Ocean Colour Scene catalogue which are phenomenal. And I, I saw them live a couple of years ago, and it was great. It was mm. a really great concert, but that wasn't really my Britpop. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I'm probably coming at it from the, the latter stages because I would have been a teenager when I first got into the to the British music scene, and I would have, you know, Dogman Star and albums uh, and Modern Life is rubbish, and the early stuff had already been out and I was still listening to grunge so it wasn't until you know the evening session really took hold of me that I started to discover sort of these bands and then discovering well being in college and then you know the 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 blur and the oasis rivalry and seeing them well not not necessarily that moment but seeing definitely maybe come out and and uh you know the, the park life come out and then actually then being completely sort of absorbed by everything and and taking everything uh you know as if it was as i've mentioned before tailored to me uh, and my age and what i was doing from fashion to what i was absorbing in terms of media and and, and you know and uh publications and stuff it was a perfect time and the perfect storm That's- of puberty and girls and love and and music and and chords and playing guitar it, it badly but doing and being able to get away with it because it's pretty mm-hmm. easy to do because <laughs> the, the songs were fairly basic weren't they uh and you could get involved well, yeah. you could get involved with it it was so easy to get involved um but yeah so i missed that kind of the the, the early time like the 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 early 90s as you said the 92 and I'd missed out the baggy scene so I was listening so to was, it. was there a specific thing Chris that's really interesting because before we started recording we were talking about your appearance on the track one side one podcast which if anybody's listening to this you must go and seek out the episode that, that, that Chris appears on that it's a really fascinating conversation but you, your first track that you choose there is Megadeth right yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's yeah. It's quite a journey to go from Megadeth yeah. to Park Life. So it was is. there one moment that yeah. you remember that kind of turned you on to that Britpop thing? I think I went from thrash metal, heavy metal to um, grunge quite easily. And then mm-hmm. as, and as grunge kind of um, became more commercial, I, I kind of went to then the more... Um, the sort of pavement and sebado type sound and then it was quite easy then to jump into what was happening or listening or at least being more um sort of open to the the british music that was coming out because it was very similar we were they were doing the you know the similar things with the guitar style it was there was less distortion and then things like the smashing pumpkins and uh, and their early albums as well. There's, there was this decent amount of crossover to sort of like the sounds that were coming out from the UK to what was America. So it was quite an easy jump from there. And actually, you know, that that whole heavy metal thing, you know, I was quite young and I was very impressionable and I had an older brother who was, you know, listening to to that. So I guess kind of part of me wanted to maybe break away from that as well. So I was looking for other things. And actually, you know, just being into listening to the radio and, you know, Mark and Lard and, and, and the evening session and stuff, they, it is a great, it's a very impressionable time, isn't it? When you're just sort of exploring what you like and then getting into bands at, at school and, and figuring out that you can actually play this sort of music quite well or easily and starting your own band. And then it was just basically free falling from there. Then it was Shed 7, Blue Tones and everything else that was coming out. All I wanted to do was be in a Blue Tones bloody covers band or something, or Shed Seven. We just basically ripped them off completely. In my, <laughs> in, in my band, Croix Turn, the, the best name of a band I think I've ever been in, which never <laughs> never went anywhere. 
Well, it's funny. I mean, that, that's that's a journey that that lots of people took. Though Chris musically, you think about you know one of my favourite bands from the Britpop era is a band called Thurman. Yeah. Who really only ever enjoyed kind of you know moderate success, if indeed you could call it success. Um, but I like them because they're really kind of throwaway and disposable, like all good pop music should be. But they were originally a heavy metal band called To Die For, um, you know, and had MTV plays and they had long hair and all the rest of it. And then, you know, the the tide begins to turn. And I think very similarly to you, I don't think it was cynical on their part. I think they genuinely, very similar to the story that you're just telling, you know, they began to hear other things and new sounds and began to think, hey, actually, you know, that's that's interesting. Let's let's see where that takes us. So that's that's really interesting that you went yeah. on that similar journey. But it sort of it it happens it happened quite a lot through the sort of noughties as well. As we come out of the kind of when Britpop well and truly dies a death, and then we move on to the sort of the second wave of guitar music with the Arctic Monkeys and that kind of other music scene that happened in the noughties that I was very much part of because my band was relatively successful in those days and we were doing quite good shows and touring and stuff like that. So that felt like more music that I was in touch with. And you you, you quite, it, you kind of can shun a whole music scene from being, because it didn't feel like cool to, to like those bands anymore. And so I was so sniffy about Blur and Oasis and Pulp and thinking, oh yeah, that's so, you know, last decade. And then as I've got into my forties, you know, and then I've re, re doing the whole podcast and everything, just think how, how sort of timeless this music is this era of music um do you think it's something we'll always look back on do you think yeah. it will be timeless and we'll still be talking about this in another 10 15 20 years time mm, there's a bit of me that hopes not <laughs> do, do you know what i mean by that chris like I, I, you know I, I look at the shadow that the beatles and the rolling stones cast over you know particularly british popular culture and now I look at the shadow that Oasis in particular, maybe the Stone Roses too, cast over British public culture. And it's great, you know, that young kids go out and pick up guitars and play music and all the rest of it. But it, it does seem slightly stifling, right? It, it, it seems to kind of just pop people in boxes. Like, this is what, in inverted commas, it's an awful phrase. This is what real music is. And for me, the really interesting things that are happening now, and maybe if we're being honest, Chris, the really interesting things that have always been happening are not the things that are on the front cover of Face and NME and Melody Maker. Maybe the really interesting things are are, are the things that are happening underneath that. So, you know, for me right now, what's going on in British electronic music is absolutely fascinating, like really incredibly interesting. And then I look back at the 90s and I think, you know, while I I still had time for NWA, Wu-Tang, Public Enemy, you know, Ice Cube, Dre, whatever... You know, I I feel like I maybe didn't give other things as much space and time as I could have because of how big Britpop was. So, you know, yeah, I hope people are still listening to the records. I hope people still look back on it. I hope people see the the positives of it. But I'd like to think that maybe people would have broken free from the chains of these cultural monoliths. When my friend Nick and I, um, the author and journalist Nick Amy's and I used to do this little Thursday night music mix show called the mild mannered mix Mm -hmm. and we would invite guests on to submit kind of you know set lists and we had lots of Britpop people on it and it was really interesting to look at the music they chose you know the the, it wasn't the kinks madness the rolling stones and the beatles that they were picking you know there Mm -hmm. was a lot of um soul rap r&b um hip-hop you know electronic music dance music so it's interesting that people who are making the music that kind of has created that cultural sheep pen almost that people find it quite difficult to escape from, they're not constrained by the label that other people have put on them. You know, they are out listening and making music that is different to that a lot of the time. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, and they're very keen to shun it completely, I think, as well as, you know, a lot of when you reach out to some some people to sort of just talk to about it they're very anti Britpop um you know and they don't the word is the the, the conversation always starts as well we weren't really ever really Britpop where we were just there at the same time and and you kind of think yeah but what what can we do can we talk can we sort of give this a massive umbrella then and, and try and put everything under it that happened in the 90s because 
you know, speaking to people from, you know, Asian Dub Foundation and, um, you know, uh, Black Grape. It's not, it's not Britpop, is it? It just happened to be at the same time. <laughs> but yeah. they, they want to, li- and actually going off another tangent, it reminds me of um, an interview with, uh, with, with Jarvis Cocker, who's doing the rounds at the moment because he's got a yeah. book coming out, who's been very quiet for a long time and now opening up to doing sort of things because he's got a book to, uh, to sort of, um, to push. But he talks, he doesn't, he, he can't even bring himself to type the words Britpop, can he? He has to uh, kind of asterisk the eye out or something. I can't remember what he yeah. said. But he's, I mean, so he says. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it. I mean, it's, I mean, that, that, that kind of thing. I mean, I totally get why Brett Anderson and Jarvis Cocker and Luke Haynes, you know, are just not having it. I, I totally get it. Um, because of that toxicity that we talked about earlier, you mm. know, and it, it's 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 reductive and it's constraining. So I I don't have a problem with these people taking that that stand. The the, the problem is Chris, Britpop happened. Britpop was a thing. Britpop was the thing that brought success to the doors of lots of those people. And while they might not like the label, and I get the reasons why, right? Flag waving, jingoistic lad culture, you know, terrorist stomp, you know, who's interested in that really? You know, who's really interested in that? But it happened and it is possible to sort of excavate from the rubble of Britpop something that was really good and pure and worthwhile, I think. But, you know, it's it's tricky if you're a bohemian like Jarvis who wants to have a label attached to them, right? What would you say would be your kind of the most underrated band from that time because i think there's a couple you mentioned in 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 the book but ones Mm -hmm. that i've always tried to get my my hands on to speak to but what would you say would be sort of ones that stood out to you as needed deserved better or more i mean that 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 list is is long um i (laughs) I would say chris if i have to pick out a few i would pick out soda yeah um i really loved soda you know a band from hull um they came tantalisingly close to being one of the bands that people would actually remember. And then there was all sorts of, you know, tragedies, really, that, that, that befell them. And, and Carl from the band talks in the book about some of those tragedies. Um, but they, they were a, a wonderful band, Soda. They had a lot of great records. You know, they, there's that famous appearance on The Big Breakfast, you know, which was like a, a Britpop launch pad for so many bands, you know, yeah. being interviewed by Zig and Zag, the aliens, which <laughs> you know, if people haven't seen it, you can find it on YouTube. It's a riot. You know, they, they were a great little band. So Soda, I would definitely have in there. Um, I really, really love um, Gary Cosby's band, Lick. And there's a chapter in the book, which is basically just a love letter to Lick. Um, mm. Gary Cosby is a phenomenally interesting and talented human being. He leaves Australia. He comes to Britain with the sole intention of becoming famous. Seymour Stein flies him from the States with the express purpose of signing Lick and Lick only. And then it just doesn't happen. You know, there's two or three singles, there's a canned album, and then they just disappear. But they were wonderful. And, and you know, we talk often about some of the criticisms of Britpop, and one of the criticisms is the lack of voices from marginalised communities, black and minority ethnic voices maybe, mm-hmm. um, and maybe um, people from the uh, LGB community. And, you know, Gary was openly gay and, you know, song titles like Come and Shirtlifter, you know, he wasn't messing around, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think Lick are another big shout. Um, I'll, I'll give you two more, Chris. <laughs> One would be Marion. Yeah, yeah. Who... I mean, I just adore Marion. And anybody who knows anything about the 90s knows why it didn't happen for Marion. And, and, and that is, you know, that, that situation is very sad. Um, but that first album, This World and Body, is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, and I, I can vividly remember buying, in fact, I've, I've got it sitting here in front of me, Chris. If we had the, the cameras on, you would see I've got my seven-inch copy of Violent Men, um, yeah. you know, which is just a, a, a great, great record. Um, so I loved Marion um, because they, they they spoke to that part of me that was broken and battered and felt, you know, uncomfortable in my own skin. And yeah, just, just wonderful, wonderful band. And then 
um, it, it has to be the flamingos. Yeah. Um, I, I really love the flamingos. That that first album again, Plastic Jewels, great. And every interview I've done for the book has been done with the proviso that disappointed by the flamingos is played at some point during the interview. Because for me, it's the great Britpop single. It's got woohoos, it's got a reference to Exchange and Mart, it's got a glorious front cover. Um, and, and James and Jude were both great writers. You know, they, they weren't just great songwriters. They, they've both gone on to have careers as authors. They've written great, great books. I could strongly recommend, if we're looking for a book about 90s culture, James's book, um, Memory Songs, um, is a terrific read. And Jude is an incredible novelist. His, his two books, Byron Easy and Jacob's Advice, are, are terrific reads. So, you know, they were a big favourite of mine. Um, and I, I will bang the drum for Disappointed as the great Britpop single for as long as the, the, the drum skin holds out. Um, for me, it would be the... I'm only going to pick one. Um, the candy skins for me their their story and and uh their kind of failed attempts to sort of break in the in the traditional sense is uh yeah. was, was is difficult to hear especially when you realize kind of what what happened where they've been and how many sort of how many times they were sort of on the cusp of it like so many bands were being flown out to the states and being promised that x y and z and then falling through at the last sort of hurdle it's such a sad business really isn't it well, they're a band that there is a lot of love for right yeah whenever whenever the subject of Britpop comes up you know if nick at Britpop revival you know tweets out oh we need somebody to pick three songs for listeners lives there's always one person who asks for a candy skin song always <laughs> it's probably me you know, so there, there, there is a community there i think of people who like me remember these bands that nobody else remembered and, that, and that's yeah. what makes the the stifling dominance of the big boys so interesting, right? Is that actually okay? Yeah, you know, people like me were buying definitely maybe and park life and different class, but actually the real thrill was picking up the latest Candy Skins record or a new single from um, Manta Ray or something from Tiny Monroe because you felt like they were your bands, you know, they, yeah. they were still the bands that hadn't crossed over into the mainstream. And, you know, music fans are snobs, right? We love the idea that there's a band that only we know about. So what's, what's next then, do you think, Paul? Are you, have, you, have you got other plans to write more? Yeah, so, um, I, I mean, like every other uh, bore on the bus, I've got a, an idea <laughs> for a novel, um, and but I won't bore you with that. But in, in terms of music writing... I have this idea, and I don't, I don't know how much interest there would be, but I have this idea about writing a book about British electronic music. Mm-hmm. So maybe, maybe going from, you know, those early kind of Human League records, you know, what was going on in Sheffield in the late 70s, early 80s, right through, you know, Depeche Mode, Yazoo, um, bits of ABC, I guess, um, Erasure, and then on into what's happening now. You know, because there is a lot of really interesting stuff happening in, in the world of electronic music in Britain. And I think that could make quite an interesting book. The, 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 the question is, of course, unfortunately, as with all things, you know, is there an audience for it? But I think that could be a really interesting book. And I, I also have this idea about the other big music scene that meant something to me. So the, the, the three things that really kind of define my musical life are Britpop, electronic pop, uh, for want of a better word, and indie pop. And I, I would quite like to write something about some of the forgotten indie bands from the 80s and 90s. You know, maybe not Britpop bands, but indie bands. Yeah, yeah. Who've kind of, you know, who've been posted missing in action. You know, has anybody ever really written anything about the primitives? You know, I, I don't think so. And yet the primitives are astonishing. Has anybody ever really written something long form about cud? Right, Cud are a great band. I'd love somebody to write something about Cud and the Primitives and the Shop Assistants and oh, I don't know. You fill in your own your own band name here. So yeah, I've I've got ideas. It's about whether or not anybody's interested in reading those. Well, good luck with it. the The book, The Birth and Impact of Britpop, which comes out on the thirtieth, you know, only a few days' time as we're recording this, yeah. um, is is amazing, and uh, I I do recommend it. I'm halfway through it. Um, and I'm hoping to do the rest of it. So thank you very much for sending one to me. Um, It's written with such great personality, and your kind of knowledge comes through in in a way that I guess I've not read before, which is commendable. So well done, and thank you very much. It's, It's a great read. 
Oh, thank you, Chris. That's that's very touching. I'm, uh, genuinely, you've got no idea how much that means to me. Thank you so much for that. Um, it sings off the page, Paul. <laughs> uh, bless, bless your silly heart. Well, um, well, we'll have you back on again for the eighties, uh, the the synth the synth pop book, shall we? Great, let's do that. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, where can we find you online? Have you got like a Twitter handle you want to? Yeah, I've got a Twitter push. handle at mild mannered max. Um, you can find me um, if you just follow the. You can probably see sort of smoke rising off the internet when I tweet <laughs> about Oasis. If you just follow that, it will take you to mild mannered max. The smoke trails from the Oasis chat. Yes, I've yeah. seen it. <laughs> <laughs> well i shall put links to the book and, and where you can buy it in the show notes to the podcast so everybody make sure you go and check it out um thanks again paul and uh hopefully i'll speak to you soon absolutely thanks chris no problem take care yeah.